Good afternoon. Sorry to interrupt your lunch, and hopefully you don't lose it with us. But uh, uh, my name is Darren Foster, Sergeant with the State Police, uh, going on 23 years now. Uh, been doing crash reconstruction for almost 20 of that. Uh, in 2010, I took over the program and been here ever since. Uh, this is our drone program, all of it. This is our command posts, three of them. Um, that's it. So we have, we have three UAVs in the department assigned to my office for crash reconstruction. Uh, so here we go. I don't even know if you can see this. So backstory, um, back in 2004, uh, when I was in the, I was promoted full-time crash reconstructionist, and they sent me to a thing called Tim's down here in New Hampshire, Traffic Incident Management. And I was actually sent because I was told that Tim's wouldn't work in Maine, go tell them that. Because we were under the old school impression that when you have a fatal crash, that the crash takes priority, we shut the road down, we do our investigation, I don't care how long it takes, we're gonna be there. So I went down with that mentality of saying, yeah, we're all set in Maine, we don't need this thing called Tim's. Uh, learned a lot during that class and found out that Tim's probably actually wasn't such a bad idea. Uh, so I took it back to the state. That was 2004. Where'd Tom go? When did, when did we first teach our first Tim's class? Uh, 2004. Was it 2004 up there? Oh, so uh, we're starting to roll it out and we've, we've kind of progressed that way. Um, so with the crash reconstruction unit, we, we got total stations and everybody's seen those standing out in the middle of the road. And you know, that was a way for us to speed up our crash times, uh, less time on scene and get better data. So we're always looking for the gr latest, greatest, fastest way to, to get things done. And obviously drones brought us here today. We've pitched drones for probably the last five years in the department and never went anywhere. And anybody, anybody looking to get a drone program going? No? If you are, I took the colonel out for drinks and the next day we had a drone program. So <laughs> if, if all the red tape fails, try alcohol. That's been my motto. So uh, in 2017, legislature patched the bill allowing us to fly drones. With that bill, we had to adopt a model policy and we actually went the extra step. We extended the olive branch to the ACLU, invited them in to help write our department policy. Uh, they thought it was great at the time, we're doing it to cover our butts because now if they come back and say, we don't like what you did, well guess what, you wrote our policy and you said we could. So we got them involved at the ground level and honestly we haven't had any, any negative feedback yet as far as what we do with them. We invite them out to our scenes, well, maybe not our uh, big scenes, but we, we work with them, we show them what we do and if I'm flying a scene on the side of the road where there's a house nearby, I'll go talk to the homeowner and say, hey, you wanna come see what I'm doing? I'm flying a drone in front of your house and we've had 100% positive feedback so far. So that was back in 2017 when we got our uh, bill passed. In May, we certified our three guys in our units and our, we have two uh, fixed wing pilots, so we certified those, them all. We all get certified in drone operations. And in June, we purchased our uh, drones, which are the, the big black, One's on the table back there in the Matrice 200 series. And so we have three of those in our office. And so to date, we've done 48 uh, crash reconstruction flights, 17 crime scene mappings, five fire scenes, and 16 uh, search and rescue, manhunt, and everything else. So our program got started for crash reconstruction only. And we, we wanted to work in that progressive model because we know it is such a big deal with the public perception about law enforcement and drones. So we, the statute specifically said you can use drones for crash reconstruction. So that was our primary focus. And uh, we knew there's gonna be other things that, that cropped up along the way, but we always follow those guidelines. And we haven't had an issue, like I said, because even with the ACLU's guidance on our policy, we don't put a drone where we're not gonna put a boot on the ground. We've, if, if it's illegal for us to be there on the ground without a search warrant, then it's illegal for us to be there in the air without a search warrant. So that's the policy we've always operated under. So 
we either get consent from the landowner or a search warrant or it's public property like with a crash scene. So here's what we're using it for. Uh, for crash reconstruction, one of the major things we want to find out is how the vehicles came together, if it's a head-on crash or whatever. So we can, we can use these for a vehicle profile. We can put the cars actually back together, either at the scene, at the junkyard afterwards, and get those approach angles to help us uh, determine which either reconstruction technique we use or how we apply that particular technique. So it provides a great overhead view of the, of the vehicles. And if we can't do this with the software, we can actually make 3D models of the vehicles and put the models back together and position them however we want. So uh, if we don't have the actual cars to line up with wreckers and skid steers, then we can use the models that we create through our software. For scene documentation, obviously a bird's eye view is usually better than a ground eye view. You see a whole lot more overhead. So we're using these with the photographs to capture the entire image. So you can see, um, this is a pretty large scene, but all the stuff you can see from there. You can, the tire marks really stand out. We've actually had scenes that we've flown at night and evidence showed up on those, those uh, scenes after they've been rendered that we couldn't even see with the, uh, at the scene. So having that bird's eye view, the evidence can stand out. We're seeing stuff that we're not seeing at ground level and it's uh, helping our investigation. So this is just one overhead photo just for that uh, situational awareness overhead. Uh, then we can process that and you know Mike talked about the PIX4D program. We use the same thing. So we can process that, render those photos in PIX4D and actually create a 3D scale model that we can tilt, pan, rotate, zoom, whatever we want. We can see that from every angle. So here is a, uh, this is a motorcycle crash on I-95 in Augusta during the, uh, it was the toy run where there was like 8,000 motorcycles going up I-95. Uh, so this just shows a rendering of that with all the motorcycles and tire marks and such. So this is a complete scale 3D model that we created just from photographs. So why are we, why are we using drones? Uh, biggest thing is time on scene. Uh, we know about secondary crashes. We know now the importance of getting the roadway open. We had, in, in the time period in and around where we got the drones, we had six uh, similar crashes on the turnpike. Three of them were done with the conventional methods of total station, and three of them were done with the drones. The three that were done with the total station had complete road closures, road shut down for uh, two or five hours and one was three hours. The three that we did with the drones, we were able to do two with no road closure and one with a partial lane road closure. And we were on scene for maybe an hour total with our investigation. So as far when it comes to incident management, when it comes to having road closures, uh, they probably pay for themselves the very first time we roll them out because uh, I think we have $30,000 total wrapped up in our entire program. And how much, Greg, how much is a five hour road closure on a Friday afternoon in Saco? Yeah. A little more than 30 grand probably. So, uh, so we're using them to speed up that process. And we all know that you know, as first responders in the room, if you have a secondary crash, who's probably gonna be there? Probably gonna be us. And we know that secondary crashes cause as many fatals as the primary crash. So we're trying to get the roadways open back up as quickly as possible, get everybody where they need to go, and uh, have them on our way. So again, time on scene with our mapping station. We're taking two to 300 points. One to two hours was the, was the normal time for us to be on scene actually physically mapping. So the problem with the total station is if, if I was going to give everybody a job to map this room, and map everything in it. What would you get? What's important? Limits. What's that? The limits. The limits? Okay. What's, what's important? If I said, this is a crime scene, go map it, which is what we get when we map crime scenes because they don't know what's important. They just say, go map it. So we're in there and we're, okay, yeah, the flag looks important. Maybe that chair's important. So we're just going around randomly and trying to collect as much evidence as possible. Same thing with crash scenes. I mean, as a reconstructionist, hopefully we know what's important, but there, there's kind of that limit where this is a critical piece of evidence. 
this is the road 500 feet away. Do I go 500 feet when my scene's contained to 100 feet? Maybe it's important, maybe it's not. So there's always that balance of how many points do I take when I'm walking around a scene with a total station because I know that I have 5,000 people waiting on the turnpike for me to get done so they can go to home or go to work or whatever. So how can we document it? Take a picture. Anybody ever taken a picture and looked at it afterwards and go, I didn't even realize that was there. You know, so with a photograph, we're able to capture multitudes more information in less time and we don't have to worry necessarily about what's important and what's not. We know the picture captures it all. So with this, the UAV can collect 100 to 200 photographs, which take my 100 to 200 point forensic mapping to now it's a 100 to 200 million point, point cloud. So every pixel has a point, every point has a three dimensional spot in space, and from that it creates a point cloud that's, that is scalable. Uh, you can view every aspect of it. And again, our flights are generally taking us between 10 to 15 minutes. That's from the time out of the box uh, doing its route and landing back down and we're packing it up. So the, the time frame on scene is not even comparable. So I talked about photos. It doesn't matter if we have the, a single vehicle crash on the turnpike or on the interstate or on a back road, or if we're talking the mega crash up in Bangor on a snowy day where there's 300 vehicles involved, a picture doesn't care. It, it's a picture's a picture. So we can process those in the same amount of time. It takes us the same amount of time to, to fly it. Um, anybody here use a total station? How long would it take you to map the one on the right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Go back in the summer. Uh, so again, you know, 20 minutes to fly, it's a complex scene, 20 minutes to fly it, we're done. And it puts every one of those vehicles back exactly where they were in a measurable, scalable, uh, viewable format. So the, uh, the advantage of the, of the UAVs is certainly uh, taking control. Here's a sample scene, uh, I-295 in Freeport. A car cut off a tanker truck. Uh, truck ended up rolling over. It was actually, fortunately, it's filled with milk, but we had a milkshake going down the road because it was about 20 degrees. So we can see the, the length and the, what was actually involved in that crash, all the tire marks. Uh, and again, uh, total time on scene, three hours, road completely shut down for one hour. Uh, and then we were able to divert traffic down the shoulder for three hours while we got the roadway cleaned up, finished our investigation. So it was actually kind of quick to have only the roadway shut down for an hour for this, but still an hour of complete shutdown. Here's a similar one. This is a, uh, a tractor trailer, rear ends a pickup truck hauling a camper, explodes it. This is Friday afternoon on the turnpike in Saco. Uh, we did this without shutting the roadway down at all. We kept all, we kept the two left lanes open. The middle lane was shut down intermittently while we were doing our investigation. We shut down the shoulder and I, w I had, I was in and out of the scene in an hour did everything I needed to do in one hour. And this was actually the very first scene that we used the UAVs for. And I still had no idea. We had actually just gotten, I'd flown the drone, but we'd actually just gotten the cameras the day before. So I was like, huh, might as well give it a shot. Why not? Um, and so I did map this one with limited mapping in addition to the drone, just because I didn't know how it was going to work. But uh, one hour on scene, no road closure. And the best part is, we can, we can keep traffic running and still get the same data that we would with a shutdown. Because what happens is, as we take hundreds of photographs, it looks in every single photo and tries to line up what it knows. What's, what common points do I have? So if I have a vehicle in one photo, but by the time the second photo comes, the vehicle's gone or it's moved, it goes, oh, I don't see anything there, we're just gonna do the road. So we have to have that fixed point in repeated photographs in order for it to show up. So I can have, and this is a uh, ortho image, so it's scaled to uh, the same accuracy as your total station or whatever other mapping method you're using. But, uh, and it, this does show all the cars are kind of ghosted. But when I convert this to a three-dimensional image, all the cars are gone because 
If it didn't see them in sequential photographs, then it didn't map them. And so all I'm left with was, is the raw roadway underneath. So it's almost like magic. The cars can keep driving. And as long as I have shots in between the cars where I can hit the road, they're, they're ghosted out. So it really a great technology that allowed us to uh, do the program. So again, we started with strictly doing crash reconstruction about, and that lasted for all of about four months. And yes, sir. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to ask, uh, is there a criteria um, for a crash that constitutes you guys going to reconstruct it? Is there, is there certain standards or is it like, well, this had a big impact, it might go to core? You know? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on where it is, what it is. If it's a, we don't even reconstruct all fatal crashes. Like if it's a single vehicle, single occupant crash, we, we leave it up to the investigator to do. But if that same crash has a passenger that's deceased, then yeah, we would roll and do that. So it, it's a case by case thing. We look, most fatalities we do do, serious uh, personal injury or something. But so again, well, come on. Yep, sure. Stay. Got it. So this is a case, like I said, our primary role is crash reconstruction. About four months after we, we got the program going, uh, this is a, a mill up in Detroit, and they, th this is a, one of the hoppers that feeds the mill. There's an explosion inside this hopper, and one of the, per one of the uh, workers, one of the mill workers was killed inside. So the fire department got there. They didn't know how bad the hopper was compromised. They didn't know if there's anyone else inside. So they called us with the drones. We were able to actually fly right in the door and look around to make sure that, one, there was no fire, there was nobody left inside, so they didn't have to compromise and put a fireman in harm's way. So in, in a matter of seconds, we're able to get up and clear that entire spot without having to put somebody up in there. So that was probably our first non-reconstruction use for the drone. Uh, this is the uh, fire scene where Captain Barnes was, uh, was killed here a few weeks ago. Uh, so they called us down. We've had done quite a bit of work with the fire marshal's office because, as you can see, what you're getting a view from this that you just wouldn't see as an investigator. So now they can tell burn patterns. They can tell where the hot spots are. We can make a 3D model that they can have for presentation. Uh, so we're getting a lot of information for, the, for their investigations as well. Uh, and this was a fun one. I, was, I just happened to be in Holton. Just happened to be in Holton. And... Uh, this, these two guys, two brothers, uh, show up at the border. You see the gas cans in the back. They went through the Canadian Customs, and right before they got to the American Customs, they stopped, like no man's land, in between worlds. So they, they stopped in the middle of the road. We could tell it was full of gas cans. And they're sitting there, stone-faced, hands on the wheel, not looking sideways, not doing anything. So we had no idea how to deal with them. All, for all we knew, that, that was uh, the bomb, you can see how the back end of the car squatted. So we're thinking, we see gas cans, we know the back end of the car squatted, they're not communicating, they're stuck between borders, what are they gonna do? So I had the drone. So I went up and paid him a visit, um, flew it up over the head, dropped it down beside him. So I got photographs of both the driver and passenger. Uh, one of the rear, they didn't have license plates, but they did have this. And this is taken from about 200 feet away. The Auto Lane and Cycle Inc. It was one of those license plate frames. So just for whatever, we happened to call this place up. They said, hey, yeah, these two guys came in yesterday. They used cash to buy this car, but they did sign a receipt. So we got the receipt. We found out who they were, and we knew who they were from, you know, we got all their background. And from there, the uh, Canadian custom, uh, actually, they brought out their big van, they rammed them from the rear, and they pushed them over to the American side, so we had to go deal with them. <laughs> but but uh, international diplomacy there, so, uh, but, you know, without that, there's no way, there's no way to approach this vehicle safely without putting somebody in danger. Uh, so, but I was able to fly up, say I got within about five feet of the guy's window, and I could have delivered him a very nice message had I had one written. Uh, but uh, 
uh, so just another use of the drone that who'd have thought when we bought these things three years ago that hey we're going to use them at the border to spell an international incident but um, say we've assisted with the tactical team we ha we do have say that we have the big matrice we have uh, FLIR cameras we have uh, very nice zoom cameras and uh, we're finding new uses for them every day so that's about it any any questions yes sir being on the border, do you have any challenges uh, if you fly into Canada? Or I didn't land. Fly into Canada? As long as you don't land, you don't go into Canada. Okay, all right. <laughs> Remember that. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. That, that's not going to make it into the cut, right? right? I was directed to do so by a superior officer. Yes, sir. You said you have 30,000 in the program. Is that for all three jobs? Yes. Uh, the, we have the Matrice 200s, which are about five grand each. And then you buy a different mapping. We have a total station now, which is Right. Yeah, your robotic is going to cost pretty much what our program did. Oh, a robotic is around, depending on which one, between 12 and 15. Yeah, for a probably a top con or something yeah but yeah so it's it's fairly cheap money for what what you get out of it yeah yes sir uh, two, two questions hey <clears throat> did you take off your uh, sensors as far as collision avoidance to get that close if you fly in sideways it, this has front top and bottom if you fly in sideways it never knows you're there <laughs> I, I, I got to the end of the story you built it up so good. Well, say the uh, the RCMP came in with their big. They had a big uh, blast-proof van, and they rear-ended it, pushed it over into onto our side. And after they went through that, they decided they probably were a little bit outgunned, so they did get out and prone down and and taken into custody. We don't. They they. It was all gas cans. They were full, but they had no. Yeah, it's kind of anticlimactic, is why I didn't end the story, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 next time I'll make it a little bit bigger, but yeah, they were just arrested. They, it's the second time they've done that at a border. They just go and cause an incident and get arrested, so. <laughs> one, one last question. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so when you're, when you're flying along the border, do you get any kind of warning that you're entering any kind of different zone? Like I know that when, I, when I, my wife's Canadian, when I get to the border, my cell phone says, hey, I'm getting ready to shut off because the horizon doesn't carry into Canada. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if there was any kind of... Uh, it, it didn't, I mean, it was in, we weren't, I wasn't, well, I, maybe I was in Canada, I don't know. But uh, we were right in that area between the two border crossings, so it did... It did have a, I did have an international boundary line on my display, but it, I, it let me fly fine. Okay. So, anybody interested in doing it, it worked. So, yes? Do you have to take many oblique photos, like with all the trailer trucks next to each other? Flying you know, straight overhead, looking straight down, I would imagine in fix 4D, it has a tough time getting in between a lot of the vehicles. Yeah. Um, what I typically do is I put the camera at probably a 60 degree angle, fly it both ways, and then I put it completely 90, and then fly it again just to get those different angles. Uh, we were talking before, probably the ni that 90 to 120 feet seems to work uh, the best for us, but we also, if I'm doing a vehicle, uh, the DJI software has a, has a program in it called Point of Interest, and I can hit that, and I start at the ground, and it just circles from the ground up to the up to the whatever height I put it to, and that comes out great. I get great 3D models doing it that way. But that it? Do you ever fly scenes that? Well, I'll call active. I'm thinking of a tractor trailer uh, full of fuel on fire, and over an hour you can see that from just the floor we had on site, you can see that evidence disappearing mm -hmm. as the fire progressed. Uh, you have a lot of flying scenes like? Yeah, I mean, we're, there's only three of us and we're all in Augusta, so chances are we're in the wrong spot. But we do, yeah, we, as soon as we can get there, we're flying. Uh, if, if it's an issue that 
for evidence or, you know, obviously if it's, if it's not going to, we're not going to do a reconstruction and, and there's no benefit for us to fly, we won't, we're not, we're not the media, we don't go up and just fly to, to get pictures of it, but if there's evidentiary value to it, we're in there. Yep. What do you guys do for storage of data? We're, and I have a problem now with cameras, so I've got to store all my cruiser camera. We already pulled 32 terabytes hard drives, and we're going to three more. And now we're putting 150 HP body cameras. So we, we yeah. have a storage issue, and we, so we set everything to purge after a certain amount of time that's not kept up and true to kind of limit that. We store all of ours in house on a server. Um, and I, I couldn't tell you what size it is. I know, you know, just one of the ortho images goes between a half gig to a f or full gig of data. Um, but it's all internal storage, and then we do backup on, we have like a 500 terabyte hard drive that we back everything up to. It's not full yet, but, um, so we haven't run into any storage issues yet, but we, we are separate from all the other department so we we just handle crashes so we just have to store the data for the crashes that we do or for the drone flights that we do yeah we use them to ground control points we uh dot actually made us up some targets they're orange and blue and yeah, yeah we, was that you well we we borrowed your targets oh okay yeah they, they just changed the color for us yep survey. um we lay those out and they've worked great so far what do you we don't have a GPS total station. We, we run it old school and we use a tape measure. Uh, take a steel tape. We know, we've, we set targets out all over the place. We measure the distance between the two. We verify those as soon as we download it, uh, the accuracy within the program. So, so you're using more as tie points than Yeah, we don't I, don't, I don't care that it's exactly here. I care what's inside of the spot that I've mapped. Yeah. So we don't use any GPS RTK. Yeah. Good, all right.